Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you all to Pediatric Grand Rounds. I want to remind everybody that starting today, we're, we're back to serving lunch at Grand Rounds. So we hope we'll see more of you here live. Uh, there's some great food here. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ted Rule, our Division Chief in Infectious Diseases, to introduce our speaker for today. Great, thank you, thank you, Rafi, and, and hello, everyone. Um, it is a real pleasure to to be able to introduce Sohil. Um, I think you know uh, more than some of our visitors. I think he's very well known to people in our department, and I suspect many um, uh, watching now, and either there in person or online, share my uh, admiration for him and, and feel really fortunate that we have him have him here. So. Um, for those who don't, he just very quickly, he completed his PEDS residency here at UCSF in, in 2013, did a chief year in 2014, and again, thankfully has stayed on with us um, to develop his career as a, as a, as a pediatric hospitalist and a real leader um, uh, in global health education, both here and in the field. Um, he's currently an associate professor in, in our department um, and co-director of the Pediatric Global Health Clinical Scholars Pathway, but um, I think an, in another really impressive turn in his career, he has really risen to meet a need um, with the COVID pandemic. I remember our earliest calls when COVID was um, beginning and we were beginning to try to figure out how to address um, and help kind of, kind of local schools address this challenge, and he really just kind of rose from his field to become uh, uh, not just kind of someone who could come up, but really the, our local expert on transmission and mitigation measures in local schools. He played a big role in the CARES initiative, and then I think rightly um, gained attention to take on leadership in this space. So he was uh, uh, tasked to be chief of uh, chief clinical lead um, here at the um, information and guidance branch at the SFDPH, and then last year has taken over um, role as lead of the Safe Schools for All team at the California. Um, Department of Public Health, um, where he's working closely with health and education agencies throughout the state to offer guidance on health and wellness and, and safety. So it's really been, um, I feel honored to have known him in this rise. I think I'm grateful to him for his role here and his role in the state. Um, and I'm really looking forward to his presentation today. So with, uh, I'll, I'll stop talking and, and hand it over to him, him now. So over to you, Sigo. Thank you so much, Ted. Appreciate that really kind introduction. Um, I'm going to jump right in for the sake of time, and then hopefully we can have a, a good conversation as we go on. So um, I have no financial uh, you know, conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, but as Ted mentioned, I do serve in an official capacity with the California Department of Public Health. Um, but today, really, the story I want to share is my own perspective on this. So me as an individual, um, and the views I'll be I'll be presenting are, you know, my own, really, and not necessarily reflective of CDPH. Um, and with that in mind, and particularly because this is Grand Rounds, I do want to focus a little bit and start with my story, just, you know, what the past couple of years have been like for me. And, um, and I do that just with the perspective of if, if you're faced with some type of large societal challenge in front of you, um, the different ways you can think about approaching it as we go forward. So I'll start a little bit with my story, and then uh, we'll move on to the work itself. So what were the outcomes? What was the process that we took on um, at the California Department of Public Health? Uh, transition to some of the lessons I learned in my foray into this world, um, and where we see things going as we move forward. So if we take, back to, uh, take us all back to those, those dark days in, in March of 2020, when uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was hitting the shores of, of the US. Um, I, was, uh, I am and still uh, practicing clinically as a pediatric hospitalist. And what I was noticing around me was just that uh, my colleagues were reacting to those initial days in such varied uh, presentations. You know, I had some colleagues who took extended leaves of absences, uh, they were really fearful for their personal health or the health of their families, such that they didn't feel comfortable working in a clinical environment. Um, I had other colleagues uh, essentially, you know, show up to work in head to toe PPE, you know, astronaut gear, essentially. Um, and then others that really um, didn't, didn't give it much, much concern, you know, back at a time where there wasn't much uh, guidance being perpetuated for it. Uh, there was just such a varying degree of how folks felt to this. Um, so that's what I was noticing as a professional. 
And then clinically, you know, as the months went on, um, starting to see different manifestations of this pandemic in our patients, right? So I took care of a roughly an eight-year-old girl with abdominal pain that after that $1,000 workup, the CT scans, the uh, imaging, the lab work, uh, the diagnosis was really a somatization of, of anxiety. Um, schools were closed, of course, at this time. Um, I went on also to take care of a, a, a young black male, uh, a teen, who um, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd um, and uh, a lack of social connectedness, uh, really smoked so much weed, he ended up with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome um, to the point that his electrolytes were so uh, deranged, you know, we were concerned about his cardiac function. Um, and then, um, you know, took care of a, a young child who, um, uh, without going in too much detail, uh, at the hands of his older sibling, ended up uh, really critically injured. Um, at a time and a date when, you know, this was a weekday, relatively morning time, uh, where they were unsupervised because their parents were um, essential workers. I believe, you know, one was a, a grocery store uh, attendant and the other one worked in a gas station. And uh, they didn't have other forms of childcare. And so just, you know, began to see um, the relationship between the, the functions that a school really serves and um, how this pandemic was affecting our patients. And then at the same time, I was also starting to see direct impacts of, of you know, COVID-19. Took care of, of children with COVID bronchiolitis, uh, did CPR on a child who died with COVID-19. So really starting to see the, the severe impacts of the disease itself. And then at home, um, this isn't a picture from my household, but it's not too different from mine. Um, at the time, I had a, a three and a five-year-old who's since, who since grown, but um, virtual kindergarten was hard, um, really, really challenging. So a lot, a lot of stresses in the household at that time. Um, and you know, I think when I'm faced with uncertainty uh, on a professional or a clinical front, uh, my happy place is, is the literature. And so um, that's really where I dove within those initial months uh, where things were, were evolving quite a bit. And I started to read uh, quite a bit. And I, you know, I would read the, the, the guidance coming out from the CDC and, and other uh, vetted bodies. Um, and then I would read those little numbers attached to those guidances. And I'd read the resources and the references that were listed there and try to get down to the primary literature just to start just for my own sake, so that I had a better understanding of, of what was going on. Um, and uh, from there, then I started to write. And so uh, published a, a narrative review around personal protective equipment, um, really, again, to give myself a better understanding of this and to share the knowledge that you know some of these studies are, are really robust around how, how we can best protect ourselves. Um, and uh, shared that uh, via some publications, uh, some presentations through Grand Rounds, um, you know, in April of 2020. And then through there, as, as Ted mentioned, started to work with others and really focus my time and efforts in the schools. So, uh, so grateful to Dr. Liz Rogers and uh, Dr. Um, Lee Atkinson McAvoy and others who worked uh, to develop the CARES initiative uh, and the collaboration that we, we put together here with UCSF to think about schools in, our, in the Bay Area. Um, also did some work with uh, my local community um, as basically an ad hoc volunteer consultant with other, other doctors uh, in the, the town where I live to really support my local school district. And then from there, worked a little bit with the media and um, supported great colleagues here at, at UCSF like Nora Pfaff, who published this really compelling op-ed about, you know, if we think about the pandemic holistically, especially in those early months, um, you know, the, the word needed to get out that children were, were absolutely being affected by this entire experience. Um, and all of that really resulted in the cul culmination of some formal positions. So worked with uh, the San Francisco Department of Public Health, um, as Ted mentioned, essentially doing what I was doing as a volunteer, but now formally for the city, which was uh, quite an honor. So to read and to write, um, so information and guidance was the branch that I worked in. And, um, you know, we carried some of the, the responsibilities and the honor of trying to develop policies for this city. Um, and now have since uh, transitioned uh, to really focusing on schools uh, specifically and doing so with the California Department of Public Health. And uh, for, for those out there who are uh, in this uh, you know, training phase and thinking about what to do with your career, my 
unsolicited career advice is to really start with the science, uh, to feel really comfortable in both, uh, you know, a grasp of the problem at hand, whatever that is, and then also your understanding of the policy solutions out there. So read what's been done before. Um, and then to get out there a little bit too. Um, I think there were a lot of voices and there still are a lot of voices, right? In this space of how we think about mitigation and COVID-19 and the pandemic and what's the right answer. But I think we as a field, pediatrics, probably a little bit underrepresented there. Um, and our patients need us. So I think the more that we can get out there, uh, grounded again in, in what the evidence leads us to believe is, is the right path forward, uh, it, 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 the better it is for our communities. And so that's a little bit about my path. Um, let's jump to uh, the, the work itself. And so, you know, for the past couple of years, um, what we've been trying to do at the California Department of Public Health when it comes to schools is really two things. It's to keep students in the classroom and to keep them there safely, right? So starting with that second, Joan. Third floor, intensive care nursery. Cold tea, third floor, intensive care nursery. So um, if we start with that second goal of really uh, keeping kids in the classroom safely and mitigating transmission so that, you know, our communities, our students, our school staff, and everyone is there safely, um, let's talk about the numbers and how we did. So maybe if I can pick on, on some of the folks in the back here, um, can, can you read this chart for me and tell me how you'd interpret it? <laughs> Uh, the graph showing uh, per state the cumulative deaths. California is on the lower end compared to the other. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's this great, uh, uh, now, now uh, who's passed away, there's this great global health scholar who says, like, anytime you're looking at charts and comparing populations, you have to look at rates, right? You have to compare things per capita. Um, and this is a chart comparing rates of, of COVID-19 uh, deaths uh, population-wide uh, in a cumulative fashion. So the numbers are only going to go up with time um, in the six biggest states in, in the, the U.S. And these are often the states California compares itself to uh, because of the diversity uh, of the states, right? They're large, they're uh, hetero hetero uh, heterogeneous populations, urban and rural mixes, uh, racial, ethnic diversity as well. So these are often the states California compares itself to. And you can see these waves of, pain, of unfortunate floor, mortality. Hospital, all clear. Home oh, pain, third floor, hospital, all clear. Home oh, pain, third floor, hospital, all clear. Home oh, pain, third floor, hospital, all clear. So in, in the beginning, right, this was the, the first wave that really hit New York bad. And then if we, if we fast forward, this was that first winter where there was a big uptick in mortality. Um, and then if we get into, you know, I'm measuring time now in school years, but if we get to this past school year, this was really the Delta wave at the beginning of the school year and then the Omicron wave here. Uh, but throughout it all, as, as you mentioned, you know, California has really maintained the, the lowest cumulative mortality rate when it comes to COVID-19. And I think that's something to be proud of, right? There's nothing different about the physiology of us here. You know, the weather uh, arguably is different, but Florida and Texas are also on here too. So not just colder states, but also warmer climates. And it speaks to our collective efforts. And that was the case in terms of overall mortality, but also in terms of our kids in hospitals. So this is that sim same comparison over that last school year, looking at, um, uh, pediatric admissions to hospitals among those same six states. And you can see that California really has, you know, X-fold lower rates of kids in hospitals compared to some of the other states out there. So um, that's some of the numbers around uh, mitigating transmission. And then the other goal of, of keeping kids in the classroom, right? Um, there is no great national, uh, you know, source to, to really pinpoint what this looks like. But the de facto reference that, that most folks refer to is a website called verbio.com. 
Um, and what they do is they uh, look at school calendars. They have a few different algorithms in place, but they try to pull school calendars and different reports and events and uh, try to quantify COVID-19 related disruptions to in-person learning. So when a school was closed because of COVID-19 um, throughout the year. It's not universal, not entirely comprehensive, but again, the, the best resource that really exists for uh, national comparisons. And so each one of those dots on the map represents a, a school closure uh, related to COVID-19 um, in this past school year. And you know, if you add them all up, um, you'll see that, that California really represents about 1% of the dots. Um, and for comparison, we, we teach and we educate about 12% of the nation's students. And so overall, uh, the, the numbers are, are okay. You know, certainly not great, but, but okay. Um, and if you fast forward to uh, really the Omicron wave starting in January, so this, this second half of the last school year, you can see the numbers look uh, even, even better there. But um, if, you, if you peel back those numbers and you, you look a little bit deeper at the data, you'll find that it's, it's you know, unequal. Certainly that impact has been absolutely unequal. Um, uh, you know, 96,000 Californians have lost their lives to COVID-19. Uh, well over 16,000 children have been orphaned, uh, meaning they've either lost uh, one or both parents or a primary caregiver in their lives. Um, and that has been felt hardest in communities of color and in low-income communities. The uh, death rates, and this is data that I just pulled this week, um, but the cumulative death rates among Latinos is 11% higher uh, the cumulative death rate among Black people is 19% higher than the average rate. Um, and then case rates are listed here for Pacific Islanders and for low-income communities, but it's all a very disproportionate impact, right? And that's, that's in terms of the disease, disease itself, but also in terms of uh, accessibility to the best tool that we have to combat it, which is vaccination. This is data around... Um, uh, you know, it, it divides basically the California population into quartiles. Um, it's called the vaccine equity metric, and it looks at a race and place based, uh, you know, different indicators uh, to quantify essentially different communities in terms of their health status. And you can see quartile one, which is considered the less healthy community, has the most number of people in it um, and the lowest vaccination rate compared to quartile four, which has the highest number of people in it, um, sorry, the lowest number of people in it, but the highest vaccination rate with a delta of about 20% of those who completed the primary series. So um, still a, a long way to go in terms of uh, correcting some of those um, inequities. And then we also know that anytime a school is shut down, there are certain communities that are gonna struggle more than others in terms of access to, to virtual learning. Um, this is data from the Public Policy Institute of California. It's a little bit older, um, but you know, un undoubtedly probably hasn't changed too much in the, in the past year or so around access to reliable internet and internet devices. And disparities are uh, you know, abound really based on uh, communities of color and based on income and education. So just using, using the one with the blue arrow as an example point, you know, Low-income communities compared to high-income communities, uh, the families in low-income communities had 25% less access to reliable internet, internet devices for their children to get online and learn at a time of, of virtual learning. So, you know, I think all of this really impacted and informed our approach uh, to creating guidance and policies for when we think about schools. Um, and really, you know, we can talk about masks and we can talk about testing and we can talk about you know, distancing and quarantine, quarantining and all those pieces. But overall, the, the big strategy and the approach that we were going for um, and continue to strive for is one centered on equity. Um, and so, you know, the, the data and the epidemiology absolutely informed the decisions, but um, as did the conversations. I remember I was at one meeting uh, with uh, tribal communities and I showed them similar charts um, and they uh, very appropriately, you know, basically stopped me and said, you know, that's great, but our children are bringing it home to our elders. Um, and that's what we're seeing in our communities and our elders are dying from this. And uh, we, are, we are scared to send our children to school because we know that this is a disease that is killing our community. Um, you know, we, we, we got letters from schools uh, and students in these schools too 
um, particularly in, in uh, communities of color who were similarly expressing severe concern about what this was doing to them. And so I think all of that really informed uh, not just the guidance, but also the way that we, we think about providing resources to address it. So you know, part of my work over the past year has been trying to, to think about the right policies to put in place. But the, the policies don't mean anything if they're not supported by tools and resources to implement them, right? So um, one of those tools has been testing. And in this last school year, uh, you know, there was a lot of effort uh, in, that, that's been put on testing, um, really focusing on allowing students to be able to access on-site testing at a time where it was really hard to get, you know, if you, pass, if, if you rewind to, to the fall of last year. Um, this year, uh, the focus has been from on-site testing much more to uh, using schools as a way to distribute and disseminate at-home tests. So right now, any K-12 student throughout the state of California um, can, can get an at-home test from their school um, if their school is basically, you know, uh, found a way to, to uh, receive those. And, and the state of California provides those to all schools um, uh, at no cost, uh, you know. And, and so that's, that's the baseline that has been set up for tests uh, in, in terms of the approach to it. But on top of that, as, as you all know, you know, to use an at-home COVID-19 test, you need a smartphone and you need a, a pretty solid degree of health literacy to be able to, to navigate some of the instructions for these tests. So in addition to that, uh, based on an equity priority scheme, um, schools can continue to access on-site testing um, and, and resources have been doled from, from the California Department of Public Health to really support that approach. Um, and the same is really held true for, for vaccination. Um, right now, any school that's interested can basically contact us and set up a, a mobile clinic to have COVID-19 vaccines conducted on campus. Um, and that was grounded in a time where uh, these vaccines in some communities were hard to get. They were even hard to get at your pediatrician's office. Uh, and data was showing that the, the best place uh, to um, correct some of the inequitable access is to host these vaccine events at schools. And so that remains the case. Any school in the state that's interested um, can give us a call, essentially, and we can set up a mobile vaccine clinic for, for COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and then it's also been the approach to uh, really addressing indoor air quality. So this is, uh, you know, such an important uh, mitigation tool that um, continues to be important, particularly as we're in a respiratory season in a whirlwind fashion right now, right? And so, uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars have been doled out um, uh, in, in particularly, uh, you know, in partnership with the California Energy Commission, we've been thinking about ways to do this um, with equity in mind. So prioritizing underserved communities through, through various metrics and, and applications. Um, and then finally, you know, I spent a lot of time really thinking about systems also. Um, so making sure that uh, schools can, um, have the right information at their, at their hands to share with their communities. Um, there's a lot of noise out there, right? And so trying to provide information in a way that schools can take and then use when, when thinking and talking about COVID-19 has been a focus of our work, um, as well as allowing schools to learn from each other. And so for context, there's about 6 million school children um, in the state of California, about 10,000 schools. Um, and each of them are doing great things um, in really innovative ways. And so what we've tried to do is create platforms for uh, folks to share from each other. And uh, you know, a school in San Bernardino can say, this is our approach and this is the letter we just sent out to our school district. Um, and a school you know, in Santa Cruz can learn from that and, and put that together. And so we've created some platforms for that learning to occur uh, for schools and for the 61 local health jurisdictions in the state. Um, who are all thinking and talking and focusing on, on supporting our schools as well. Um, so that's a little bit about the work itself. And then in terms of the lessons learned, um, you know, I, I think there, there's been, uh, the, the word of 2020 in my mind uh, was the word unprecedented, right? That, that word was used so much that year. This is, we've never seen anything like this. Um, and that's true to, to a large extent, absolutely. But every time, right, a, this is a new virus, then it became this is a new variant. And then there was just so much uh, 
I don't know if hyperbole is the right word, but but it, it would manifest a lot into uh, an energy of anxiety and fear um, that uh, took a lot of time and energy to say, you know, we we can do this, we can work together, and we can get through this. And there were certainly new things, right? Um, the scientific advancements and the technological breakthroughs of testing and vaccination and and the speed at which they occurred were new and important and game changers, no doubt. But some of these other tools have been around for 100 years, 150 years. Um, on the left here is a baseball game played in 1919 with masks um, at a time of an influenza outbreak. Um, on the right here are school children in New York in the early 1900s learning outside in wool suits on their rooftop in the winter uh, because of uh, a need to combat tuberculosis. And so these, these concepts are, are tested uh, not only through science, but also through you know, em empirical uh, trials um, as, as we've had to, to manage. This is, this is not our first pandemic as a, as a human society, right? So we've had to use some of these tools in the past. And then what, what's also not new is, is the scientific method. Um, and this is something, you know, I think for all the, the trainees out there, this is something I, I found myself going back to over and over again is, is this is what we do every day when we take care of patients because every encounter really is arguably new, right? You, you, you take your SOAP note format and you take that subjective information, you take that objective information, create your assessment, create your plan, and then iterate and then do it again the next day because things are new again that next day, even if it's that same patient. Um, and so, you know, speaking of iterations, I think an another takeaway uh, for, for me is, is I feel like when we were, um, and, and by we, in, in this case, I really mean uh, state, local, national, uh, international, the approach to thinking about mitigation in schools, I think was one based on this premise was based on if we do everything we can, if we can set all these layers in place, we will keep our kids safe. And then that's the right approach. Um, but as time went on, you know, I'd, I'd argue that the curve actually looked a little bit more like this. Um, and that on, on that one side, certainly it's important to, to, to put layers in place that mitigate transmission, right? Um, and if not, and there's strong science to support this, there will be more transmission, there will be more spread of disease, and there will be more unfortunate mortality and morbidity. Um, but on the other side, we do have to pay attention to the operational hazards, right? You can't fit all the kids in the classroom if the desks are six feet apart. That's just the reality of the way schools are set up. Um, if you're trying to track down every single person who's been exposed uh, with a virus that had, you know, exponential doubling times and, and the, the, the speed of transmission, particularly for the Omicron variant, it becomes um, operationally impractical. And, um, and, and that leads to stresses on the system, which lead to staff burnout, uh, which lead to principals that are uh, contact tracing and teaching and running their schools and, and uh, trying to do everything all at once in a way that, that's really not sustainable. And so while the response was far from perfect, you know, I'm proud of California for um, really starting this last school year, trying to keep these considerations in mind. And so, you know, I think we were uh, among the, the first states to have no um, uh, minimum physical distancing requirements. Of course, that's a helpful tool, uh, but the, the, the focus on masking, on testing, on vaccinations, on ventilation, on those that were uh, operationally uh, not easy by any means, but um, uh, possible, I suppose I'd say, uh, was was one that we kept in mind. Um, and similarly, you know, I think we as a state, and certainly we in, in the, the K to 12 school community, transitioned away from quarantining and uh, took a different approach to exposure management uh, when it became clear that. Um, Focusing on that would uh, not necessarily mitigate transmission effectively and certainly would put a stress on keeping our kids in school. Um, what's this? Maybe I'll ask you, Meg. <laughs> it's Swiss cheese, that's right. Uh, you know what it's not is it's not cheddar cheese. <laughs> and I think uh, that's that's another lesson um, for, for, uh, me as, as we were going through time is there was a lot of talk about the Swiss cheese model of mitigation, right? Where if you 
layer all of these tools together. You have masking in place, you have testing in place, you have vaccinations and uh, ventilation, all these pieces. Then even if they have holes within them, overall, you will stop the spread of a disease. And I think that Swiss cheese model um, was one um, that certainly was implemented in you know, the public health strategy throughout the US. Um, uh, for, for me, what I noticed is that sometimes uh, there was a lot of time and effort trying to think about that as if it was cheddar cheese, as if there were no holes. And, and the questions we would get asked and the questions that are important to address would be questions like, you know, if, you, if you're supposed to wear a mask all the time, what do you do during lunch? Um, if, uh, if, if two negative tests is better than one, then how long do you keep someone out to get that second test done? How much cleaning is the right amount of cleaning? Um, all those, I think, are very, very important questions, and they merit, you know, robust discussion and engagement. But sometimes we would lose the bigger picture that every layer in and of itself is going to be imperfect, right? And there, there won't be necessarily a hundred percent block with each layer. But zooming out a bit and thinking about the entire process and the entire toolkit that we have at our disposal uh, was uh, was an approach that at least I personally had to had to. I think, think about and think through in terms of the balance between these, these, these items. And then uh, finally, I think another important piece was just uh, the importance of the re relationship. Um, you know, the, the health sector and the education center uh, sector have historically worked together, but not as robust as perhaps they, they can be or should be. Um, and a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money, frankly, has been spent on developing the infrastructure for these two entities to talk to each other and to do so at a state level and at a local level. Um, there's uh, been one effort in particular, Assembly Bill uh, 86 from the legislature, that basically poured $25 million into this effort uh, of standing up these relationships. And uh, I think that that's just been so important for people from these communities to talk to each other as people um, and to get to know each other and to work on these issues. Um, and so, you know, I've spent a lot of time over the past couple of years really in meetings uh, with these two parties, thinking through the issues from uh, all of the perspectives that I just shared, you know, the operational perspectives, the staff perspectives, uh, what we're seeing clinically, the data on, on transmission, um, all of these perspectives are so important to come up with the right, right package of interventions. Um, and I think, you know, UCSF uh, does a great job of this with folks like uh, Dr. Anda Kuo and Dr. Dana Long, who really think about how to engage with a community authentically. And those of us in health um, really need to continue that relationship with education. And so, you know, I think that's really the next chapter to me is to lean in as, as COVID becomes less the headline. And as we think about child health uh, appropriately, more holistically, um, this, is, this is our moment, I think, to really think more about how we can continue to work strongly as a health, uh, you know, as a health person to work with our educational partners to, uh, to make great strides. And so in the past you know, several months, uh, we've been using these same channels and these same relationships to think and talk about many other forms of guidance that's really needed out there. So uh, in September, when much of the state was 110 degrees and football practice was just starting, right, in kids who've spent the past three years uh, or two years uh, not playing many sports at all and not, not communicating with all, um, so you know, arguably quite deconditioned, um, within a matter of days, we were able to uh, work with the subject matter experts and provide guidance to the schools about how to think about heat and how to think about conditioning and how to recognize the signs of heat illness in a way that, frankly, I don't think would have been possible before the pandemic. It's using those relationships between health and education throughout all levels to push guidance out and to push resources out um, if and when necessary to address uh, what's important. Um, you know, other examples of this are um, as the hysteria and the homophobia was starting to rise around monkeypox, and we would hear stories about um, same-sex couples being ostracized and being told, you know, uh, by other families that they don't want their kids in the same classroom because they're afraid that they're going to get monkeypox. 
um, we were able to produce guidance out and, and, uh, and communication tools and resources uh, to really uh, provide uh, the community with a better understanding of transmission, which is exceedingly low, if not zero, uh, in, in these K-12 and child care settings. So to provide that idea of how to, to manage exposures, how to think about transmission. Um, and again, you know, fundamentally to, to leverage that relationship between uh, health and education. And then finally, in recent uh, times, over the past month or so, we've been focusing uh, a lot on fentanyl which uh, is not a new problem. Um, you know, it's been, it's been uh, harming Californians for a significant amount of time, but in particular since about 2018 and 2019, um, including our children and including on school campuses. And so um, we've used these same relationships and the same work um, to talk about fentanyl in these spaces. And um, in terms of, of demonstrating the impact of that, uh, you know, after uh, providing some alerts, providing some communication messages, and hosting a few convenings, applications to a state-based program uh, to receive naloxone, right, which is an opioid antagonist, uh, very fast-acting, similar to an EpiPen in terms of a life-saving intervention, um, applications to receive naloxone from the state of California at schools, uh, you know, basically. Uh, skyrocketed after this time period. And we've seen uh, the amount of applications within two weeks be the same as the preceding nine months of that program. So uh, again, speaking to the importance of, of these partnerships and, and these relationships. And so I'll close um, just with uh, really a call for all who've, who've ever, you know, over the past couple of years, been talking to their teachers or been talking to their principals or superintendents and been working with the schools, either as individuals or as an institution, as UCSF has, uh, to lean in now. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about in medicine about negative feedback loops. This is a positive feedback loop. Like health and, and education are so synergistic. And the, the child, you know, the healthy child is the one who attends school. And the child who attends school lives a healthy life. They are, they are uh, mutually beneficial goals. And strong, strong data to support that. Um, I've got one reference at the bottom here from the AP Council on School Health, but many other resources as well that show you know, mental and physical health are really a pre prerequisite to being in school. Um, you need to be healthy to be there. And uh, the amount of years that you're in an educational environment oftentimes is very strongly associated with the amount of years you live. Um, you know, that correlation between educational attainment and, and longevity is, is there and it's robust. And so um, that's my ask really of all of you is just to continue the work that you're doing um, and to think about this relationship well beyond COVID as we move into, into the future. Because my fear of all this is, is that apathy uh, it's going to lead to atrophy. And uh, if you don't invest in that relationship, that's to the detriment of our patients and our, our population. So um, I'll close with that. Um, a ton of people to thank. It's been a, a whirlwind of the past couple of years. So I won't go through all these names, but really so grateful for the mentorship and the leadership of folks um, at the California Department of Public Health, at the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and certainly here at, at UC um, for, for teaching me and training me and, and guiding me along this path. Um, and also to, to just all the students, the staff, and the families with whom I've had uh, the, the pleasure of interacting with over the past couple of years. Um, so thank you, and then happy to take any questions.
your point about the healthy child being like, well, you know, that is true, and then there's a little knock on effect that parents need to work. And so I'm wondering um, on a statewide level, what's happening out there to try to influence school policies so it's not too much. Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. I think it's such an important question. Um, I'll take it from a few different angles. So, so one is, you know, as we start to see more RSV, more really everything, right? A little bit of flu, human metanumovirus, rhinovirus, enterovirus, you, you name it, it, it seems to be out there. Um, in terms of mitigating transmission overall, uh, what we're what we're often doing is is actually leaning uh, in on the COVID guidance and saying, you know, this is you can almost think of this a little bit as a respiratory pathogen playbook, um, and that idea of thinking about ventilation still important, right? That idea about thinking about masks still an important tool. Uh, that idea be about being vaccinated against the diseases for which there are vaccines, uh, you know, flu and COVID. Um, and we'll see where these vaccine trials with RSV go, but that's that's very exciting too. So in terms of uh, prevention, I think those are some of the tools we continue to uh, prioritize and mention. But to your point around attendance as well, uh, we are working on uh, essentially what we'd call an all symptom guide, uh, because to, to, I think I think you're rightly raising the point that um, well, a co couple different layers to this. So one is that. Um, the, the folks who are making some of those adjudications on if a child should be in school or not are, are not often health trained. Um, there's not enough school nurses out there. Uh, there's, you know, 10,000 schools, as I mentioned, and there are not 10,000 school nurses in the state of California. So we are working with um, the California School Nurses Organization and a number of other organizations to come up with a standard guide and a standard approach to uh, not just respiratory diseases, but to diarrhea, to pink eye, to anything, right? To think through like, when should one uh, be excluded from school and when should one return to school? Um, it's gonna take some time and going through the, the, you know, the, the process of, of, of gathering information around it. But the hope is at the end of the day, then we develop a product that allows for some standardization so that whether you're a school clerk or whether you're a parent, you're referring to some type of universal guidance around this. Um, it's never going to be a, a place, just as you mentioned, where there's not going to be any infectious disease or communicable disease in a school setting, but it's about, you know, doing our best to mitigate it and certainly to think about uh, severe diseases potentially a little bit different than others. Thanks. First of all, wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, as I was listening to you, I was just sort of reflecting a little bit about uh, what what, have, what could we learn, what have we learned from this whole pandemic? And um, I think that, you know, as you look back on it, not to necessarily criticize ourselves as a, as a medical profession, but looking back, it seems like, uh, in, in fact, some of the advice that was coming out, as much as it was with good intent, actually turned out to be incorrect. Uh, and, and, and the whole uh, notion about closing the schools is, is one example of that, where, uh, you know, as you were alluding to there, if anybody suggested, well, maybe that's not the best idea, but they were ostracized with so much emotion behind these, these things. And um, you probably know there's just recently been uh, some reports coming out showing that the, the kids in the United States have lost a tremendous uh, uh, progress in their school testing, et cetera, this past year, record, uh, record loss, and probably uh, So one of the takeaways that I kind of think about from this is maybe we could have been a little more humble in how we provided recommendations while still emphasizing that we are learning. And we don't have necessarily have all the answers because I think what has happened in part with um, how this all became politicized is that every time the medical profession made a, a stake, put a stake in the ground, this is what we need to do, it turned out to be wrong. It, it, it resulted in loss of trust by certain segments of society that just sort of metaphor itself. So anyway, it's more just a comment than a question, but I just 
that's just been something I've been reflecting on, just wondering what your thoughts might be about that and what we might learn about you know the next time. Yeah, I mean, I very much appreciate the comment and, and take it to heart. I think I think humility is is important, right? Um, and and perhaps the other way I would characterize it is um, being able to defend uh, the policies out there uh, with the with the evidence uh, to you know to to make the case to essentially uh, we are recommending X, Y, and Z because this is the data that we have to make those recommendations. And yes, we can argue about the studies and the pieces as we should to come to uh, the, the best answers possible, but we're moving forward in real time and we have to make some decisions. Um, so, um, you know, I, I guess what I would also add is, is that humility is important, um, uh, but as is uh, the importance of, of thinking about communities uh, for whom um, they often don't have a voice and they need a strong policy landscape behind it to, to ensure that they are safe. Um, and so it, to, to me, it's a little bit of a balance uh, between being humble and being flexible, but also sometimes actually um, having to put a stake in the ground and having to make a decision um, at a time even when it's uncomfortable, uh, but keeping you know, the, the data and the equity pieces in, in mind when doing so. Does that, does that make sense? So no question, and a huge shout out and thank you so much for your service to help us make it out in the field of the CDPH and so grateful to represent the CDPH for us. Thank you, Dr. Pam. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you all. Take care.